since you were already talking about being in the UK, you've got to tell the cop story then. Sure. So that, yeah, uh, that was in the UK. I was in the UK from 96 to 06. I finished school there and that meant that weekends, I was always going somewhere in the country to do shows. Uh, all my PTO was in support of going and doing a show somewhere. Every now and again, I get booked somewhere exotic like Amsterdam or Dubai or something like that. But for the most part, I was performing domestically in the UK. I was using an early online map system called Multimap because I had to get to some show somewhere. And Multimap was like the UK MapQuest. You'd go on there and type your address and then you could print your directions. And for some reason, I never thought it made sense to go and reverse the directions and print them that way. And that was always a mistake. And I never learned from that because in the UK, there's a lot of one ways. You just can't reverse, retrace your steps to get home. It's a different process. And coming at the end of a show, there's a lot of cognitive load on me trying to get home, looking at my maps, looking for street signs. In the US, all of our street signs are pretty high up, typically either on the street lights or on the, the traffic lights or at least on poles. In the UK, they like to put them down on the ground on these squat little signs, and they save some money not using that kind of retro reflective paint or whatever the term is for that paint that glows. So they're low down, they turn black at night, and they're often covered by shrubberies and things. I was returning from a gig. Now, in the early days of my career, I had no idea how to make any kind of meaningful money. I think I was probably losing money on every show I did, but I didn't care about it. <laughs> And I just wanted to get out there. But the older seasoned pros at the Magic Club would give me different tips on how to make more money and just little subtle upsells that people don't even notice. It's not an upsell. You're giving them more. But there's a, a nominal cost associated with this. Nominal. So there were a couple of these. One is instead of using regular cards you buy at the store, you can offer to, to, to upsell them on cards that rather than the generic design, they had their logo or the bride and groom's name and the date or whatever on there. And there was a guy who would make these pretty cheap and he would buy the nastiest cards that, that you could buy that don't have this air cushion finish that the bicycle and uh, these are tally hose, but the air cushion finish or any of that, they didn't have any kind of finish at all, but that's okay because the old timers before we had these modern card manufacturing processes had developed a technique using something they called fanning powder. Fanning powder is basically zinc stearate, but it's dry lubricant essentially for your cards and there's a process to treat them. And you go to the magic shop, they would buy zinc stearate in bulk from an industrial supplier and then they would apportion it out in little bags and sell these at an insane markup because everything in the magic world has an insane markup. So I had some fanning powder in my custom cards and they said, yeah, just charge them five pounds a deck or something like that. And Alan would do them for one and it's a little more money. And at that time, at that age, that four pound net profit can make all the difference. The other thing they said was always get paid in cash hey. uh, with a wink and a nod. He said, just tell them it's part of the trick and then work the money into your act somehow. And then I read one of the books that's actually on the shelf behind me, Ted Leslie's Paramiracles. He has a, a routine that he used to do that was one of these sort of Russian roulette type of routines. It would be Russian roulette with your, with your fee in cash. And now I didn't possess the kind of personality and gravitas and whatnot that this sort of imposing German magician had. So it didn't quite play the way that I hoped it would, but I, I almost did it verbatim as it was in his book. That you bring somebody on stage and, and I would always get the most beloved character in the organization. This was often the tea lady, typically an elderly woman who made tea and would push the tea cart around every day at three. Everybody loved the tea lady. So I'd bring her on stage and made for a lot of drama because she would take my fee, the cash, put it in an envelope and mix it with four others that contained tissue paper. Wow. I would don a blindfold. She would mix them up. And I had a, a very expensive fireball. I would snap my fingers and about three quarters of the time, the ball would just burst into flame. And one quarter of the time I'd, I'd lose my whole showiness and I'd have to go over there with matches or a lighter or something and get that thing burning. But don the blindfold, she'd mix them up. And, and I would instruct her dramatically to one at a time, throw the envelopes into the fire. <laughs> and... This was the gag that Ted Leslie had was you carry a starter pistol or a prop gun. In this case, it was a prop gun that I stole from the theater department, but 
I was also a theater kid. No surprises. What a shock. And I stole it. I never gave it back. And I, I had it. And it was a fairly realistic revolver. And not like today where you've got the rules of all the things that you have to do to not get shot. But also the, the odds of getting shot in England are pretty low, typically. Or at least historically. Everything's set up now. <laughs> the, the trauma of this piece was when we were down to two envelopes, I would have her face me. I'm still blindfolded. And I would say, okay, the envelope in your right hand, take it, throw it in the fire. Now, now. And she would throw in the fire. I, I'm almost a little bit aggressive, startle her a little bit. And I would just like, now, now, wait, no, sorry. My right, your left. But at this point, ah. it's already in the fire. And now you've got this moment. And so then I would hear the chuckles, the nervous laughter in the audience. I'd rip off the blindfold. I'd look at the audience. I'd look at her. I'd see her sheepishly holding the wrong envelope in her hand. And I would say, what have you done? And then I would try to look menacing. I don't think it worked. It's hard for an 18 year old to look menacing or however old I was a pretty young. I would try to look menacing and I would say, you better not have screwed this up. Hey, God. Or else. And I would pull out this pistol. Pro tip, never pull a gun on the tea lady. No. Sure way to lose an audience. Yeah. But it was all a setup for the gag because you pull it out or else. And you pause for two beats. And then your facial expression would just completely melt because I really need that money. And that was the gag. That was a little switch. And then, of course, I'd reveal everything's fine. There's the money. Hey, give her a round of applause. Thank you so much. And they're just like, I'm so glad this guy is done. Yeah. And off I would go home. So I'm driving home one night yeah. trying to reverse engineer my return route from my driving directions involved opening my briefcase where those where those maps were filed and i think at one one point i stopped at a gas station to get a snack so i busted into the cash and i guess my tracking while trying to read while searching for street signs and all of those things uh, my driving caught somebody's attention it caught the attention of the municipal police and i was stopped and what started as a Routine traffic stop. Pretty fancy driving you're doing there. Can I see your license and registration? Have you been drinking? Things like that. What started, innocently enough, suddenly and shockingly turned on me. Because at one point, we're having a conversation. The next point, I have been forcibly removed from the vehicle. And I am thrown onto the hood or the bonnet of my car. And I am now in handcuffs. And this happened literally in the blink of an eye. I was not expecting it was not prepared it's 12 30 one o'clock in the morning i'm terrified i have no idea what's going to happen and the officer says to me now i'm going to search your vehicle is there anything i should know and i'm thinking yeah it's a mess i'm sorry <laughs> practically lived in my car he says what am i going to find I'm like, sandwich wrappers <laughs> this narcotics firearms and that's when it dropped on me because on the passenger seat of my car was an open briefcase and on display was a stack of cash a pistol and little baggies of white powder <laughs> and that was what the officer saw <laughs> as soon as i realized that i'm, I'm trying desperately to explain this i'm no you don't understand and of course he's heard it all before I said, no, you don't understand. I'm a magician. Yeah. You could see a little pattern interrupt was hit. He's <laughs> a magician, huh? Yeah, the, the, the prop and fanning powder. And I'm trying to explain this. And he uncuffs me and says, okay, do a trick. Show me and something. He ended up showing him a card trick. And he put me back, hands on the hood, the bonnet. And he's back on the hood. And he goes into his car and does something. I don't know what. He's keeping an eye on me. He's on the radio. I can't hear him because I didn't know if he's going to tear up the ticket or get the shotgun. I, I guess it wasn't going to happen. But it turns out he called for backup because a few more minutes later, two more police cars show up. And they get out and they exchange pleasantries. And he says, everything under control here? He says, yeah. Show him what you just showed me. Yep. <laughs> and there I was at like 1 30 in the morning, standing in my headlights, doing a little show, but I didn't get a ticket. And in fact, 
it was about, I want to say six months later, I get a phone call and, and the, uh, the officer who originally pulled me over, he says, Mr. Carducci, this is PC. I forget what his name is. PC police constable. He says, this is PC. So, and so do you remember me? I'm like, oh yes. Oh yeah. This is indelibly burned in my mind. I will never forget this. And he says that they were having their, the precinct Christmas party and they wanted to come in and do magic. Uh, <laughs> you got a uh, gig out of it. <laughs> I got a gig out of it. Now, the only thing he advises is whatever trick you do with a gun, don't do it. Yeah. But other than that, we look forward to having you. And Did so he at least I'll... take the fanning powder or not? He did not. He looked at it. I, I don't think he did the taste it. I don't think he did that. But he looked at it. I think it was the wrong texture. This yeah. was clearly not. I. I don't know what. I mean, I'm sure know. he looked at the pistol and realized pretty quickly it was a prop, right? Oh, yeah. 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 He, he looked at all of this. and But, yeah, they didn't take anything, thankfully. And lesson learned. Leave that stuff in the trunk. Lesson learned. One of a list. 